Hi, I'm Jason Mears and this is the History of the Data Center Part 3. And Part 3 is about the evolution of the data center starting with the 1940s all the way up to the 1990s. So the story starts with mainframe computers which have been around since the 1940s to the present day. Uh, mainframes are highly resilient. They have a 99.999% uptime. Um, this means that they are ultra reliable because they have things like hot swappable components. So what that means in, in simple terms is you can add, remove and replace components of the computer without having to turn off the computer. So components are swappable while the computer is running, something we call hot swappable. Um, they have an extremely high throughput so they can process billions of transactions per day and most of these transactions are performed in high speed memory. So you typically find these in people like uh, retail, airline, financial and payroll purely because of the amount of transactions they can do a day. It's because we're, we're at a scale now where we need to process billions of transactions a day. Original mainframes started with specialist processors which were vacuum tubes and early transistors. They also had specialist memory, something called Williams tubes and core memory. And originally data was held on um, paper, but in uh, computer sortable punch cards. So sometimes when you hear people talk about mainframes, they'll talk about mainframes and punch cards, which were the way that data or programs were entered into a computer. And mainframes started with early versions of hard disk drives. From about 1950s onwards, we had hard drives in mainframe computers, but they were very low capacity, around 3.75 megabytes. And in the day, they would have cost you £3,200 a, uh, th $3, a month for 3.75 megabytes of storage. The interesting thing about mainframes is they're still used um, to present day and the reason that they've lasted so long and they're still in use is uh, down to the high throughput, billions of transactions per day and the highly resilience. We still do not have anything more resilient or that can handle more throughput than a mainframe which is why many banks and financial institutions still use them to this day. Now for most people a mainframe was the kind of thing that a company, a large company, could only afford to buy one of um, until the advent of mini computers where suddenly we had a computer that was much cheaper than a mainframe and now an individual company might have one in individual departments or a department could afford its own computer. So they use multi-user multitasking operating systems, things like VMS and Unix um, it had a reasonably high throughput, millions of transactions per day, so still in millions, but nothing like the billions that a mainframe can do. And classic minis were 16-bit, super minis were 32-bit. This refers to the width of the system bus, or the amount of information they can process at once. The wider the bus, or the more the bits, the more it can process at once, or the larger the data set it can handle. And typical users for a mini computer were people like manufacturing, telephony, computer aided design, and early process control. Minis had various models of processors. Um, terms that you'll hear banded around with mini computers are things like DEC PDP and VAX, Data General Nova, Hewlett Packard HP 3000 and HP 2100 series. Honeywell Bull DPS6 and DPS6000, IBM mid-range computers, lots of vendors started building uh, mini computers, um, all different uh, makes, models and, and styles, many of them incompatible with each other. And with mini computers came specialist memory, so up to 4 gigabytes of memory per server, the 4 gigabytes being a limit of a 32-bit operating system. And we also started to have um, slightly bigger hard disk drives, floppy drives and tape drives. So this is where tape drives started to come in, where people use tape drives for storing data or making backups. We then move on to supercomputers. So we've had supercomputers roughly from the 1960s to the present day. And most calculations are performed in CPU, but modern supercomputers are increasingly using GPUs or graphics cards or graphics processing units to do some of these um, massively parallel processing tasks. Um, you have high speed interconnects um, between supercomputers because normal networking you would use in an everyday home or business is not fast enough. Even a 10 gig network is too slow for a supercomputer. Interesting fact here is that 90% of the top 500 supercomputers use an operating system called Linux, not Windows. 
and another interesting fact is that the memory in a supercomputer is both distributed and shared across all the nodes of the supercomputer because these computers are generally made from from assembling lots of smaller computers together uh, typical uses for a supercomputer things like weather forecasting aerodynamic research um, breaking passwords and encryption using something called brute force um, and then things like nuclear nuclear and molecular simulations um, the brute force we talked about is nothing more than just simply trying every single combination until you find the right answer so it's not an elegant solution we are just using brute force and strength to eventually get the right answer And one thing you'll find with supercomputers is it's not unusual to, for a supercomputer to have over 100,000 processors per cluster. And again, another useful, interesting fact is that 93% of all the top supercomputers in the world use off-the-shelf Intel Xeon processors. So the same processors you can buy in an everyday computer or everyday server. The thing that makes them special is the way that they manage to combine hundreds of thousands of these devices or nodes into one big computer. Um, the rest of the computers on the top 500 list use processors from AMD, the Opteron, uh, Sun Spark or IBM Power. But it just goes to show that you can actually use commodity components to create a world beating computer if the, cl if the software that combines them together is smart enough. Um, a supercomputer has distributed shared memory, so up to 2 petabytes per cluster. So just to put petabytes into context, 2 petabytes is the same as 2 million gigabytes. And the other thing they have is things called a distributed file system. So a large distributed file system with shared nothing. So the, the shared nothing simply means that a component can fail and it doesn't have any or a minimal impact on the rest of the system that there's enough redundancy across the file system to, for it to tolerate failures and we use these file systems for holding data whilst it's waiting to be analyzed or for storing the results of completed jobs again commodity hard drives with a clever piece of software that turns it into a world beating file system and then we move on to personal computers so when we get to the 1990s and up to the present day, we now have computers that are low enough in cost to allow companies to give every member of staff their own personal computer or PC. Uh, most people will remember PCs, uh, depending on how old you are, starting with MS-DOS, Windows for Workgroups and Windows 95. And typically we started using personal computers or PCs for word processing, spreadsheets, presentations, emails, web browsing. Again, um, don't be frightened by the, uh, the the numbers and the serial numbers here. We're just talking about the, the type of processors that we get in a personal computer. Uh, I will explain the reason for showing all these shortly, but we started off with a process called the Intel 286 and 386 and 486 um, that had companion math score processors, so an extra chip that you use with the processor to make it good at maths. And then we started to moving into the Pentium, Pentium Pro, Pentium 2 and 3 and 4 type processors. And then we moved to things like Core i3 and i5, i7 and even i9 now. And AMD's offering things like the K6, Athlon, Phenom, Ryzen. Um, other company called Cyrix had 586 and 686. But there was a, a whole plethora of, of modern processors that went into personal computers. Memory in a personal computer typically in the 1980s you might have up to 16 meg of RAM in the 1980s, maybe up to a gig in the 1990s and in a modern day PC it's not unusual to see some workstations or heavily used PCs having up to 192 gig of RAM in a modern PC. And um, personal computers started to introduce things like hard drives and CD-ROMs on a on a personal level. So we started with things like MFM drives, ST506 drives, uh, things you're probably more familiar with, SCSI and IDE hard drives. But also we started to see CD-ROMs appear. But um, interestingly enough, you, in order to have a CD-ROM in, uh, in days gone by, you had to connect it to a sound card. It was the only way of having a CD-ROM. But this is where we started with personal computers and the advent of every single person having a computer on the desk if the job function dictated it. But the bit I want to go back to here is this bit here. If you notice when we talk about processor names, there are lots of processor names or numbers that end in 86. 
um, 286, 386, 486, 586, 686, or you know something 86. And if we replace that something with an X, you end up with a, a description for these processors as X86. Now you may have heard this used in in sales and marketing where we talk about X86 processors and X86 servers. The reason for that dates back to the historical names of the processors we used in personal computers. So X86 just means something from the family of processors that started with the 286, 386, 486, 586 and 686. So just a bit of history on where we get x86 servers from because again it's an assumption that most people make that when you say x86 everybody knows what you're talking about. So when we take all those things and we put them together we end up with something called servers. So a server is nothing more than a very powerful PC or computer used by a business usually for a specific application or specific business function and what we find is that these x86 servers have now become mainstream and all these commodity components mean we can have quite a lot of processing power for relatively little cost and now each business or department or application owner can afford their own server that can be used to centralize and share information with all the other PCs or personal computers in the organization. So at this point businesses are now starting to use computers and servers and information technology to give themselves a competitive advantage. And the next section we'll move on to is section 4 evolution of the data center where we'll talk about what happened from the 1990s uh, to the present.